Hi, everybody, and welcome to Interactive versus Narrative, What is the Future of Storytelling? My name is Lori H. Schwartz. I'm currently the governor of the Television Academy for Interactive Media, representing professionals who work in the interactive space. And I'm also principal at a company called StoryTech, where we look at trends between media companies, tech companies, and brands, and help them move things forward. And so uh, one of the things we're really looking at right now um, across all my many hats is this idea of can something be interactive and still be a narrative? And at the Television Academy right now, that's really a primary question. And I wanted to take you through two quick slides um, and then we're gonna get into the panel. But let's do a quick introduction so you can get excited about who you're gonna hear from. So let's start with you, Mirand, and just go down to a speed intro. Hi everybody, my name is Mirand Nouri. Um, I am from NBC Universal. I work on our content team and I'm creative, a, a creator and executive producer of a project called 1111. Hello, I'm Ryan Bell. I work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. I'm also on the uh, Television Academy uh, Interactive Media Peer Group. And uh, yeah, I work a lot with uh, interactive media. I'm Maureen Fan, CEO and co-founder of Baobab Studios. We're an interactive, immersive animation studio. We won six Emmys, and my co-founder wrote and directed it all for Madagascar films and also ants. Hi, I'm Eric Elder. I'm a professor at Loyola Marymount University and also a consultant, AR VR consultant for the university right now. Hi, I'm Ted Chilowitz. I'm the futurist at Paramount Pictures. It's a very strange job, and I am a <laughs> super fan of these other four lovely people right here. So um, let's have a hand for a panel. So, we, so we've, um, we've actually uh, curated a panel of people representing all these different you know, venues or content companies or types of content uh, where we have you know, officially a Paramount or an NBCU, and then we have an independent, Maureen, and then we also have NASA, who you're gonna learn is a really big content company, or NASA. I say it like I'm from Long Island, because I am. And, <laughs> and Eric, who's representing education and consultant, um, and then of course Ted from Paramount and Futurist. So you're gonna hear from them how we're struggling between this idea of interactive versus narrative, and especially coming from a body that awards Emmys, we have to land what we call things. And so I wanted to share with you the discussions that we're having right now as we try and define television and storytelling. And we look at, you know, in the past, passive sto storytelling. We've all heard the lean back idea. But then we're looking at now this idea of interactive storytelling. So how many of you saw Bandersnatch? Right, so this idea that you interact in some way, and it could be through so social media, it could be through your remote control, lots of different um, platforms looking at this right now, but you're altering the content or you're altering the direction of the story based on what you're doing. And then we have immersive storytelling, which is really the theme at the show here, which is it could be AR, it could be VR, it could be MR, um, uh, or uh, whatever you want to call it um, today. <laughs> and then experiential storytelling, which is a lot of what's happening in location-based experiences. It's a lot of what's happening right now at the, uh, when you go see a show like, um, uh, what is it called, Sleep No More, um, where you're interacting in the story itself physically. Um, and then um, emerging stories that, uh, technology platforms, things that we haven't seen yet. And so when we were looking at the future of our peer group, because we're really advising the Television Academy proper what, how to define all of this, we had to redefine who we are. We've been interactive media, the interactive media peer group for the last few years. And what we realized is that interactive media is actually a subcategory of really who we represent as professionals. And you see some parallels between the two slides. So our constituents now are actually folks doing interactive media, but they're also folks doing immersive, they're folks doing experiential, and then they're folks doing things that we haven't even heard of yet. And so we're on the cusp of actually changing our peer group name and moving away from interactive media, and we'll be announcing that in the next month or two, but this is just a demonstration of how confusing and wild this world is. And so we're gonna start now with our friend at NBCU, and he's gonna talk to us a little bit about his project, 1111. And as we go through this, you're gonna see how this idea of defining this changes among our different folks, and then I'm gonna go out to you and ask some questions, okay? So let's start with Mira. Tell us about your project at 1111. Sure. And so, I can show the video whenever you want. Um, why don't we start first? Okay, here we go. Fate has been decided. The 
their story has yet to be told. But why watch it from a distance when you can view it up close? Live the final moments and then relive them from different perspectives, with different characters, no! or above them all. Developed exclusively for virtual reality and augmented reality. 1111 is an immersive multilinear narrative experience. Six interwoven stories unfold in parallel. Follow them, move between them, or break off and explore a doomed world alone. You decide what you see. You decide how you see it. This is 1111. So cheerful, so tough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> super upbeat. <laughs> so, so tell us what we just saw. Yeah, so 11.11 um, is our new experience that we launched last week for VR and AR. And really what it was was our attempt at coming up with a new format for storytelling that was built from the ground up for these technologies. Um, there's a lot of great content out there for VR and AR. And the thing that we find, though, is that they're either games or they're narrative experiences that are either kind of short, five to 15 minutes, or they, um, they follow uh, traditional structures that we're really familiar with, like an episodic series, for example. Um, they're great, but we thought there was an opportunity to kind of examine the technology for at the state it's at today and really use it to its maximum potential and step back from these formats that we're all used to, like episodic series or even a three-act structure for a movie, and, um, and start from scratch. So we set out to come up with this new um, kind of experience, and we had three kind of loose guiding principles. Um, the first is that we wanted to have 90 minutes worth of content, at least. The reason being is that we wanted to be able to say that this is a feature film's worth of stuff. Um, you may not watch it in the same way, but you have 90 minutes of content that you can go and explore on your own. Um, the second is that we wanted to use original IP and develop something from scratch. Uh, this was really so that we had the flexibility to make the best decisions possible for the experience. And also, to be honest, uh, any known IP will have a lot of stakeholders involved. And we just wanted to unshackle ourselves from any sort of um, IP that we would have to back into. So um, it really gave us the flexibility that we needed. Um, and the last and probably the most important is we wanted to make sure that we were doing something that was only possible in VR and AR. Um, there's so much good stuff out there now for traditional screens that, you know, whether it's um, you know, a, a series you watch with your friends at home or watching a movie on, you know, on an IMAX in a cinema. I saw Endgame last week, or sorry, uh, a month ago. And it honestly felt like an immersive experience because it was so intense. And um, the bar has been raised so high that we really wanted to make sure that whatever we did, we differentiated enough from these traditional formats so that it, um, it made it worth strapping this uncomfortable box onto your head and sitting in there for, for 90 minutes. So with all that, um, like I said, we stepped back from film and TV, and we actually found more parallels in immersive theater, so things like Sleep No More, um, where the audience, or in our case, the user, is placed in this environment, and they're sharing the environment with the characters. Um, and everything is happening in real time on this shared timeline, and the user or the audience has the ability to now follow whoever they want. Now, in immersive theater, in real life, it's great, but when you have two characters and one goes this way and one goes that way, if you follow one, you don't know what happened to the other. And the only way you could do that really is to go back the next night and then follow the second character. And if there's more than two characters, do it a third night and a fourth night, et cetera. Um, and even if you had the time and the money to do that, it would never be the same thing twice because you have real life actors. But with VR, since we can manipulate time and space, we can do that. We can actually rewind time and now follow the exact same sequence but from a different perspective. And we put in a lot of really fun tools that allow you to interact with the story so that you can see things from different angles. And, and by doing so, um, you might get some other information that you wouldn't have just by standing on the other side of the room and watching the same scene over again. So you're, you're incentivized to go searching for it. But it's important to note that it's not a game. It's interactive, but you can't change anything in our story. Um, everything is the same every time, but uh, you have the agency to see the story how you want it. So it's always there. You just have to go and find it. And we think there's something really interesting about how that 
um, changes the storytelling experience. So it's not necessarily as active as a game, but it's also not a passive experience either. Right, and when I did it, um, I had trouble with the controllers only because I'm not a gamer and I wasn't used to moving through sure. it. But it was so cool to be a goddess. Yeah. Because oh, <laughs> you're gigantic part. in this story. And I was like, oh, I would love this in my regular life. Yeah. But, um, you know, it was really fun. Yeah. Really the goddess fun. mode thing is, allows you essentially to shrink the world and create it, uh, this tabletop version of the entire island that you saw there. Um, so it doesn't really show well on a 2D screen, but when you're in there, the characters end up being about this big. So it's like you're looking at this living dollhouse and you can see all the stories playing out below you. And it's really, really fun. And for, for NBCU, are they building out a, you know, are you leading a new VR studio inside of the, of the network? It's not necessarily that. I mean, we're, we're just terribly fascinated by the technology. And obviously, NBC Universal has tons of different groups, whether it's film, television, parks. Um, so we're all just excited about what the possibilities are now and then giving the user or the audience the agency to kind of start taking more control of the story, even though we're not necessarily doing a game. That's great. All right, let's jump over to Ryan, um, who, um, whoops, um, Ryan, who represents um, NASA. <laughs> and tell us about your role there and, and what this project is about. So um, we had a spacecraft. I, I, I do digital media strategy. I, I, I have a weird NASA title, uh, <laughs> as we all do. But I work in the communications and media department. <clears throat> And uh, we had a spacecraft that was running out of gas after uh, 19 years. Not exactly gas, it was hydrazine. <laughs> uh, and so because we'd found uh, places where life could exist, we couldn't just let the spacecraft go. Uh, we had to decommission it. I have to watch my words because we, we, we can't say the C word. We, we, we're not going to say crash. Um, so we had to melt it into Saturn's atmosphere. Which and happens to all of us all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like you do. Just go ahead and melt it. And so so, <laughs> so we had to make a campaign for this. And the spacecraft was pretty forgotten in many ways because it had been going through uh, for, for so long. And so we put together Cassini's grand finale. And leading up to that, this is more of a media event and a strategy. So it, when, when I'm talking to my friends that are in VR, it, it's kind of what goes along with, with, with how you're releasing something. And so we had, as the live broadcast was going, we had a live 360 video with picture in picture of the live broadcast. So you could be inside of Mission Control and, and be there with the engineers and the scientists. And, all the components, uh, so this was uh, submitted to win an Emmy, and it did end up winning an Emmy. And I believe it was because of all the components that went along with this finale. Uh, we had scientists and engineers talking live with the audience, answering questions on multiple platforms during the YouTube Live 360, throughout Twitter and all that stuff. So you'll see a lot of components that, that NASA does on a very large scale. We are a content production company. We are constantly looking at ways to create new content that, that is space related, of course, and, and very, very new. So we, we're the first to do stuff with HoloLens and that had an effect on, on, on Ted, which I'm, I'm glad it reached the right person. Um, <laughs> so, I, I, I'd say play the video because okay. it, it shows what the drive was there. We're federally funded. We are your space agency. You know, you, you guys pay my salary, so I have to throw <laughs> your, away your trash after we're done with it. <laughs> uh, so, so our job is to get this out in every way that we possibly can. Okay. And this is how we did it. This is the story of a space robot and the humans who loved her. In 1997, there was no interactive peer group for the Television Academy. Frasier, Law and & Order, and Third Rock from the Sun won Emmys in September. Shortly after, in October, NASA launched Cassini from Cape Canaveral for a 2.2 billion mile journey to Saturn. 20 years later, NASA had to develop a campaign to convey the magic of a mission that had landed a probe on another moon dove between Saturn and its rings, and collected enough science and imagery to inspire future missions. 
To prepare, we launched a multifaceted, multi-platform campaign on Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, and the mission website, running nearly daily updates. We visualized the mission through gorgeous animations and real imagery, and developed a curriculum for thousands of classrooms with science-themed teachable moments. The Cassini Grand Finale broadcast was dispersed as widely as technology would allow. We delivered live video across multiple platforms to every device, streaming apps, and traditional media broadcasters. During the finale, our team released multiple 360 videos with the crown jewel, a live 360 from inside Mission Control that had picture in picture and interviews, commentary, and of course, science throughout its broadcast. Through strategic timing and the sheer magnitude of excitement, the public reaction made Cassini the biggest NASA-driven social event to date. Hashtag Cassini trended globally with 8 billion potential impressions. Its finale commentary was seen 2 million times, and more than 3 million people visited the Cassini website during the event. As people shed tears for a robot billions of miles away, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and 18 other newspapers across America ran front page stories and photo spreads. Google made a doodle. Walmart <laughs> made an alternate happy ending. And editorials of the Washington Post <laughs> released headlines like, The Cassini Mission Embodies the Best of Humanity. We encourage you to take a final dive into Cassini as well. Our supporting website and PDF are complimentary to this video and give direct links to the apps websites, and communities that are still being inspired and learning from Cassini. This is NASA's first mission entered for an Emmy with the Interactive Media Peer Group. Thank you so much for your consideration. Yeah. So, so this won an Emmy uh, last year and we were all crying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, me. I, I, I still like. I wrote the, that script, and I'm, I'm like, I'm like, oh, I did a good job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I need to go excuse myself, but uh, you, you know, we, our, our job really is to inspire and to educate, and we want to do that through technology, um, and we want to do that in ways that that touch people, because if it, if, if it if if this touches someone, then then they'll understand that they can work at NASA, they can be something other than an engineer or a scientist. I, I am not, you know, I had, I had no idea a few years ago I'd be working at, at NASA, but we have artists, we have an artist studio, um, and we work with a lot of VR uh, companies, a lot of AR companies, we're always looking for the next cool thing to do. Um, and Ryan, so when it comes to this idea then of defining what you're doing, defining the kinds of platforms you're using, do you talk about, well, this is gaming, well, this is storytelling, or does it not matter? It has to be more storytelling. It, you know, it, gaming, we have done stuff with, uh, you know, with my Xbox Connect, we, we made an interactive, like, land, land the rover on Mars type of, type of thing. You know, we're, we're looking at doing something next, like, so Sony's got a new uh, thing that's kind of inside out VR called the Warp Room, and we were just visiting there. I'm always trying to find those, those cool things that we, we can do. And, you know, I, I have this, this weight, this responsibility where I know that whatever we put out is going to be seen by a lot of eyeballs. You know, our, our, our social media impression is in the multi-millions at every, every center. And so it just has, like, like we tr our last landing, we trended on Cyber Monday above Cyber Monday. Like, <laughs> like you know, that, that's, that's a very loud voice. And with, with that comes great responsibility, I think. Yeah. Something yeah. like that, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you're not going to tweet something in the morning and remove it in an hour because people didn't like it. <laughs> I have nightmares. <laughs> like, like, you know, I have, I have NASA's Twitter on my phone, and my baby will be playing with my phone, and I'll be like, oh, God, oh, God. <laughs> you know, that's scary as hell. All right, let, let's jump over to Maureen now, um, who's, whoops. Not again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, and Maureen is representing an, an independent production company. 
um, with people that have come, came from experiences at formal networks and studios. Um, so tell us what your perspective on all of this is. Sure. My background is more games. I've done some film, but mostly games. I was a vice president of games at Zynga looking over the Farmville franchise. So it's not hardcore games, it's games that are accessible to everybody, right? It's not just what you stereotype to be a gamer. But my two co-founders, my CTO, Larry Cutler, he was at Toy Story, he was at Pixar Toy Story 2 and also Monsters Inc. technical director, then DreamWorks head of character technology across all their films. And Eric, as I told you before, um, Madagascar Films and Ants. So they come from film. The mission for our company is to inspire the world to dream by bringing out their sense of wonder to make them want to be astronauts and <laughs> go for things that they really think they could, uh, they may not think that they can do. But we added something um, to the end of that statement this year, uh, to the mission statement that says, um, and to make you matter. And that last piece is what we realized we've been doing <laughs> actually for the last three and a half years of our existence, which is, it, storytelling, we believe, is essential to human species. It's, if any of you have read the book Sapiens, there's a theory that it's the reason why Homo sapiens beat out everybody else. It's because of our ability to tell other people's stories. We need stories. That's how we, that's how we evolve. And VR, AR allows you to not only passively uh, think, what would I do if I was in that scenario? You can actually live it. You can actually be in that and experience it yourself and see what you would actually do. The opportunity with merging film and game, I don't like to use those terms as you said because they're very different, is the ability to tell the story, which is so crucial. That's something that all of us know how to understand, but let you be a part of it so that you care even more about that story. The stakes are even higher. You care about those characters even more. You're even more engaged. So what we've been doing for the last three and a half years is experimenting, merging everything that I know from the interactivity side and everything Eric and Larry know on the game side, I mean, on the film side, and figuring out how we can bring these two things together. And that's really hard, right? Because if you're trying to tell a story and you give people the ability to interact a little bit, they may just be interacting the whole time. You're like, what can I do? What are my powers? Let me totally ignore the story. If you then say, okay, you can only interact at this time so that I make sure you watch the story, then they feel totally straitjacketed. They're like, why can I only interact now and not at these other times? Mm -hmm. So the many different pieces that we've done, um, Invasion, Asteroids, Crow, and now Bonfire, have been us testing out hypotheses of how you merge these things together and seeing how well they work well or not. And we've won an Emmy for every single one. So I'm very happy about that. I, I didn't so. personally give them to her, so. I <laughs> it's all good. But I would love to show Bonfire, which is our latest, which is our most interactive piece yet. In this one, we make you the main character. In the past, we've made you a sidekick or an omnipotent force. And in this case, Eric thought, you know, storytelling is about putting other characters under pressure to, uh, to reveal their true nature. What if we made you the main character and put you under pressure to reveal your true nature? What decisions will you make and what will it tell you about who you are? You guys know Ali Wong. She is the best. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And you all should watch Tuka and Birdie, her new show. And also her Always Be My Maybe movie that's also coming out. I don't know why I'm um, publicizing her. <laughs> that she's an Asian female. Asian American female. <laughs> so I, anyway. but, but when we talked, you were really uh, specific about how sometimes when you're doing a game, it's all pre-planned. And that's the piece that's different about this, right? 
Yeah, so oftentimes uh, when we were doing games, you plan out the core loop, right? Uh, so for example, Farmville, it's like dig, plant, harvest. <laughs> that would be the core loop. For Minecraft, it'd be like dig, kill, dig, kill. And World of Warcraft would be like run, kill, run, kill. So it's whatever the core loop actions and everything goes around that. And the funny thing with games is people, oftentimes filmmakers think that game people are giving up complete control to the audience. That's totally not true. That a great game designer is actually in complete control and getting you to do exactly what they want by making you think that you have control, but you don't actually have control. Um, and in film, you write a script instead of the core loop. And in film, all the way, you're changing the script all the way to the end, right? And everyone's always like, why can't you just figure out the script ahead of time? It would save us a lot of money because it's got to evolve and get better. Same with the core loop, you're constantly changing. But when you're trying to merge the two together, you have to com completely come up with new ways of mapping that out. So for us, we in particular have both a script and in the script it says, you are written in as a character. And then we also have a game design um, loop thing drawn out to merge those two things together. And then when we create it, we do the vertical slice, which is similar to what you do with games, to see if the interactivity and the uh, script, the narrative work together, not until we have confidence that that works, do we then do the rest of it. So there's all sorts of processes that we've had to develop in order to merge the two things together. Yeah, it's a, uh, such a crazy world of, it seems like a lot of work. It is a lot of work. Not just writing a script. And it's hard when you have people from both sides because they kind of look at, it's really interesting, like you see a lot of the Hollywood studios, right? Um, we're invested in by a lot of them, so I love them. But oftentimes Hollywood <laughs> studios are like, oh, the younger generation, they're all doing interactive stuff, we want to get in it. But they may buy a game studio and then eventually lay them all off. <laughs> it doesn't work necessarily. So games people and film people feel like they don't understand each other, but there's actually so much more overlap there than they understand. Like they're a Reese's peanut butter language. cup. Kind of yeah, perfect. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm hungry. <laughs> um, okay. well, let's jump over to Eric. And Eric, again, is representing the educational side as well as an independent consultant. So give us your perspective on all of this. Yeah, so, um, you know, I'm coming from the perspective of, you know, I started off as a traditional animator years ago. That's what I went to college for. Um, you know, I, I drew animation on pencil and paper and filmed on an Oxbury camera. Um, and so, you know, and then trained uh, people to work in, in traditional animation and, and went to work there for a number of years. Um, so it, it's been really like a natural progression for me seeing the, the animation process and then going into uh, video game development and training people to work in AAA. Um, you know, uh, we were one of the first programs uh, to train people to work uh, in the video game industry. Um, and so, Coming from that perspective, I could really see like, you know, there's so many similarities between the animation production process and video game development, and the big difference is the interactivity, right? Um, you know, again, whether you're coming from from 2D or 3D, everything in the world uh, has to be created, right? Um, and you know, the storytelling, like, it's interesting because you, you have to have a good story, of course, when you're dealing with film and you're dealing with animation, right? Um, we love to have a good story in terms of games, but it's not really essential, right? The overriding factor when you're doing um, game development is the interactivity. Like, you can have, uh, uh, you, there's no such thing as having a game that has a great story, but, you know, the gameplay is not there. I mean, that's just not a good product, right? Um, so it's really um, a matter of like blending these things together um, and again the VR and AR is the next progression of that like having it be the immersive step you know and, and then on the education side are you seeing universities be able to build out programs to teach students what you're talking about yeah I mean again it's 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 interesting like going back to you know GDC in the early 2000s, right, where people were, were saying, oh, I have a, a mythology, um, you know, class and a computer science class, and I'm going to put those things together and, and have a, a game development course, right? It took a really long time um, to, and, and again, I think a lot of universities have struggled. Um, we were really lucky being, um, you know, we had a lot of choices to pick a tool to use 
uh, for game development in our program, and we were really lucky and, and smart in a way in, in choosing Unreal um, before it was an actual game engine. It was really more of a game at the time that had a editor. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the tools have been evolving for the animation production process and the video game development um, process, um, you know, at, at quite a fast pace. And it's only accelerating now that we're moving into the VR, AR. You know, I'm like really fascinated by, um, you know, like, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Adobe character animation, um, but now you can do live action camera with, uh, or live, um, capture animation with the camera that's on your computer, which is amazing, right? Um, there's amazing things like Mindshow, um, where you can get in there in VR and um, you know do these live performances. You know, these are the type of things when you know when I was growing up, learning animation, you know, it was it was impossible. There's no way to get to a really um, meaningful result in animation without you know, tons of expensive equipment, lots of people on a team, and, and months and months of work. Um, and so, you know, everything is, is evolving in a really interesting way. And I think that's, um, it's, it's almost, I don't think it's really a, a good thing to do to, um, you know, really classify these things or, or um, break them up in such a specific way because, you know, the. The, everything is evolving very quickly, and it's only going to, um, you know, happen more so as we move into the future. So. Yeah, and we'll come back and talk about then how do we give out awards, or maybe we shouldn't, because you have to land a description for what you're awarding. But let's go over to Ted, futurist, man who needs no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your perspective on this. Um, well, I mean, my perspective on this is, like I said when we were doing introductions, I'm, I'm a quite a big fan of what is happening in the world, what these people are doing, and what the sort of world around us is starting to experiment with this blending of what we call traditional narrative storytelling and interactive use cases, and the emerging of the devices that allow these stories to start to come to life in a way that traditional flat screens were always restrictive of. Um, when I sort of give talks and run around the world, I, I talk about where we sit now in the age of pixels, and that we're actually in the age now, emerging into the age of dynamic spatial pixels, where pixels are no longer restricted to a flat body, like that big screen over there, or the one down here. They actually can move and track with you like real life. So in real life, our world is made up of these visual things that all have space, and if I stood up and walked around and moved around, every single visual pixel that my brain is perceiving will change its orientation. We now live in an age where we're able to commercialize the idea of that, and that is what we call virtual reality. Mm -hmm. And it can be massively emotional and massively sort of life-changing. So just on the, the projects that I've seen just on this talk, Maron's project, when he was showing me at South by Southwest, I had this sort of complete epiphany of like, finally there's a group that is really getting this right. Mm. That they understand that they can use these pixels in a way that a traditional screen can't. And he built this really engaging story that runs the length of a movie, but works in an interactive way because you move around it like you would in real life. Like if the world was a theme park that you could strap onto your face. And that's kind of incredible, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And then in Ryan's world, you were making reference to it, a number of years ago, in the very beginnings of the first HoloLens, which by the way, if you, when you get a chance to see the next HoloLens, is HoloLens 2, it is a remarkable device in many, many ways. We could talk about that if you want. But I had this incredible emotional wave moment when I got to literally walk on the surface of Mars. So and this became public now years later, but when we saw it, it was all very secretive. We had to sign all these NDAs and go into this special lab at JPL. And they put a HoloLens on me, and they said, now what you're going to see here isn't a simulation in the way that you would think. We didn't just design this as sort of like a game-like experience. You're really going to walk on the surface of Mars through the HoloLens. You're going to see the visuals as we represent them. But if it's really there as you're walking around this warehouse, 
it's really there on Mars. So if that rock is there and you can't get around it, you can't get around it. If that pit is there and you walk there, you would theoretically fall into it. And it just hit me as like it was a technology out-of-body experience. I didn't have to get in the rocket ship and go to Mars through technology. They kept my body on planet Earth and they brought me to Mars. And I literally walked around the surface of the planet. And it just kind of like hit me, overwhelming, that I'm literally doing this, that there's the rock, and it's there in real time. And it was just like this crazy emotional, like couldn't even control it sort of thing. Um, and then Maureen and I are good buddies, and we've been connected forever. When I was at Fox, we helped move that along from a financial standpoint and some other things that we've been doing. And I've been tracking her progress both um, inspirationally and sort of supportively and watching how much better each iteration of the understanding and refinement of interactive and story gets in this last piece, Bonfire. I encourage you all to play it. You can buy it on an Oculus Quest if you have an Oculus Quest. If you don't, try and get one because they're amazing. Um, and you will get a sense of how you feel like you're really in that world. And it's just phenomenal. Do you want to um, show the, the video? Um, sure, if you want. So yeah, so in my world, I, I get to Oops. Oh, well, you can show that video again, again if you want. Um, in my world, I get to sort of play around with interesting things. This is kind of an interesting audience because I'm curious. When I give typical speeches, I'll show this at the end, and usually I'm the only one that's done it. But in this case, I'm curious who's used a Magic Leap? Who's played the Dr. G game halfway through, all the way through? All right, only a few. So it might be interesting. It's like a four-minute video. You might want to watch it. This, what I like to do is demonstrate things that aren't like the marketing fluff video. I actually really did it and sort of recorded it, so you'll see what, it, what the magic actually is like. So you can see. This is your house, right? That's my house. <laughs> You're gonna get a little trip to my house now. That's my wife, that's my dog. That's Magic Leap. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It is the day after Halloween on 2018, and I'm wearing a Magic Leap 1 developer headset, which mounts uh, to a small little microcomputer that sits in your pocket. <coughs> and I'm going to play in my living room. This is my living room in California, in Los Angeles. I'm going to play a game called Dr. G that Weta created that actually sort of a adventure, story-driven video game to literally take place in your living room. So now what I'm doing is actually scanning my living room. And now I'm looking around the room with the device. And it's scanning as we speak. And now it's last year. Patient. <laughs> okay, it's loading up. So what's pretty remarkable about this is that there's this robot creature that's floating in my field of view, and it actually looks real to me. Like it is sitting there in my living room, and the smoke trails that are coming out of it are realistic. Like it actually looks like it's a real thing, which is pretty amazing. And now it's kind of opened up its little. Uh, navigation world, so I pull 
<laughs> you say that so casually. <laughs> yeah, it's an everyday occurrence for me. It's very fun. And the dog is just, what is going on today? <laughs> cool. So that's what I get to do all day. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you had said to me the reason you wanted to show this was because, first of all, it's the best thing you've done on Magic Leap, you said, but also it really speaks to this idea yes. um, that, that you're engaged in the story, you're interacting in right. the story. So a real storytelling group, Weta, put it together. The graphics are incredible. The story logic is very kitschy and fun. And it, it isn't just like randomly you're doing stuff. There's a reason that you're doing it and you're paying attention to the narrative that is an interactive narrative, very similar to like how very advanced video games, story-driven video games, of which of course is a multi, multi, multi-billion dollar industry now across the world, um, have succeeded so mightily on, but still being kind of trapped in that rectangle, right? And now with these devices that are still kind of on this curve from like wrong to right, still a little bit on the wrong side of the curve. Maureen and I talk about this a lot, that as things get more right with the device, the market expands exponentially. And like, you know, we see major moments, like with the Quest coming out, $400, all in one, no computer, no wires, has a lot of great experiences, a lot of good IP floating around, yours is one of them. And it's a, it's a game changer in, a, in the next sort of step, the next evolution of it but it's still more wrong than right. Like it's not going to be a massive mass market product. It's the next step in the evolution, probably another 10 years of figuring out circuitry, componentry, the human equation of what makes these devices really correct. But we start to see touch points and this Dr. G game is a major touch point for me that it starts to tell you that there are real serious entertainment people experimenting with this stuff. Our friends at ILM Lucasfilm are doing this as well. They have an interesting thing for Magic Leap that they're doing, as well as for the quest that they're doing. Um, so we pay close attention to these things, and in my sort of secret lab, we're experimenting with lots of things, living in that curve and... Is that your living room, or is that a place? Uh, <laughs> well, it's multiple living rooms. My, my house is kind of this bizarre circus that all the kids <laughs> in the neighborhood come over and play Beat Saber and do fun things at, which is fun, and my office, as close as you could call it as an office at the studio, so I still work in this old traditional movie studio in Hollywood, but I have this kind of fun house office with every possible piece of gear that exists today and many things that don't exist at all yet in the public eye that are starting to show me we're, gonna, we're at kind of the bottom of this pendulum and we're pushing toward the right stuff now in the right formulations and I have pretty high confidence that we're going to get there. Uh, let, let's